Okay, perfect. So, um, thank you for having me at Linux Plumbers. That's a great, you know, uh, place for me to be right now. Um, and I'm sorry in advance because uh, it's the second presentation of the day and I'm talking about systemd. So, you know, sorry about that. So, uh, what I'm going to talk about is some work I've been doing in systemd, um, which I called Secure Boot Automatic Enrollment. Um, so, in a first um, section, I'll try to explain, you know, uh, where I come from, what is the goal of that, why do I even want that in the first place. Then I'll go over um, what I did exactly, and then I'll have a bunch of questions about that feature and um, if there's any feedback on this kind of feature. So first, my bio, I'm a former security researcher at the French Cybersecurity Agency um, in France. I've been a sysadmin for quite a few years um, in different organizations. Um, on, well, I I've seen a lot of places uh, deploying systems, um, physical and virtual, and so that's where I come from. Um, pretty soon I'll be searching for a job, so if you have any job opportunity, you know, let me know. So, uh, my main goal is that throughout the uh, different organizations that I've seen, um, UFI on Secure Boot is still black magic for most users. Uh, when I'm talking about users here, I'm not just talking about um, on users, but I'm also talking about organizations. Uh, lots of organizations don't know what to do with Secure Boot. Uh, actually, I've been in plenty of them where the uh, main thing you would do with Secure Boot would be to find a way to deactivate it as a first step. Uh, you know, kind of like um, what you would do with SE Linux if you ask a lot of people. It's too much of a worry, let's just deactivate it. Um, now, I don't want to say that Linux with Secure Boot is not good because it's actually really great with the Shim project. Um, there's been a lot of work on that project. On nowadays, you can just install Linux on a Secure Boot enabled computer really easily, and it just works. That's that's really nice. Um, now, using your own keys entirely is still not super convenient, um, and it often requires you uh, using the UFI UI, which might be of a varying degree of refinement, let's say. So basically, can we make it easier to use Secure Boot with your own keys without messing with weird UFI firmware? So the solution I came uh, with was automatic enrollment. Basically, uh, Secure Boot uh, keys on variables would be baked in your system. Uh, for example, if you have a deployment image that you deploy everywhere, you would bake in your keys in the system and then they would be enrolled at the first boot. So you would have your keys in the image again, you deploy your image and at first boot, it locks up the uh, physical device. Now with confidential computing on very conveniently, we just had a presentation about confidential computing. Well, with confidential computing, even in the cloud, you might start to have uh, to, to want to be able to use Secure Boot. Um, actually, a part of why I developed this feature was because I was messing around with Google shielded uh, VMs in the cloud, and I kind of wanted to test out Secure Boot, but yeah. It wasn't that great of an experience. 
So then I'm going to go really fast over that because I'm assuming all of you are familiar with UEFI and Secure Boot. Um, so Secure Boot, uh, you know, it's a part of the UEFI spec. It was first um, in UEFI 2.3 in 2010. And then there is uh, the audit mode feature from uh, UEFI that was deployed in UFI 2.5 in 2015. So that's going to be important because I'll come back to that later. Um, basically, SecureBoot obviously allows the firmware to run on signed binaries. So, SecureBoot keys. Um, I want to go over that a little bit because it's a nice refresher to know which keys are involved in secure boot. Um, if you want the ultimate detail about all of the different keys, you can go check this blog post by, well, conveniently James Bottomley, which is somewhere in there. Um, on his article lays out everything you need to know about secure boot keys. So basically we've got four big kind of variables that are controlling secure boot in the UFI firmware. You've got the PK, so the platform key. It's a single key and its goal is only to update um, the next key, the key encryption and keys. So the CAC is actually a list of keys that updates the DB or the DBX and can also sign binaries. Then you've got two uh, variables that control uh, which keys are essentially, which, which, what is whitelisted on what is blacklisted, DB and DBX. So um, here, basically the uh, smallest setup you can have would be uh, PK, um, CAC, on DB. Uh, DBX is essentially used for revocation of, for example, firmwares that have been compromised but were signed by a key um, in the CAC, for example. Uh, but it's not strictly necessary. And then there is MOX. Uh, if uh, some of you have been messing with Secure Boot a lot, you know about MOX, machine owner keys. So what about them? So MOX are not in the UFI spec. It took me an embarrassingly long amount of time to figure that out. Um, I, I was getting confused with uh, where are the machine owner keys uh, defined in the UFI spec? They're not. Um, when uh, like I was talking about with Shim, basically Shim uses MOX as UFI variable in order to uh, allow you to add more keys without messing with the UFI firmware itself on the normal hierarchy of keys. So this is an entirely different thing that I won't be talking about. Uh, Besides, I would rather not use Shim as an intermediary uh, before my bootloader. So my contribution, you've got the pull request uh, over there on GitHub. Um, yes, sorry, systemd uh, uses GitHub. Um, on systemd as a bootloader, so if someone didn't know that, um, systemd took over your bootloader. Um, it's actually, in, it didn't start in, uh, in systemd, it was uh, formerly gummy boot. It's kind of minimalistic on its UFI only, which fits my uh, bill because I want to develop this secure boot thing, which is going to be available only on UFI anyway. So it has been merged and it should be available in V252. Uh, so it should be soon available on some distos. So what I developed already is that by telling systemd um, about a set of variable, so a set of 
PK CAC on DB, you can have systemd boot uh, automatically unroll a uh, secure boot without user intervention at the next boot if you so wish. So it's not something that is forced. You can choose exactly how it happens. Basically, you drop your set of variables onto your um, ESP, so your system partition. And then um, you can choose to have them automatically on all the next boot, or you can choose to have uh, systemd boot prompt you um, whether you want to uh, install these keys um, as your secure boot keys. Um, so before any of that can happen, obviously the uh, secure boot needs to be in setup mode. Uh, that's the main uh, thing you need to do before uh, being able to automatically unroll um, your variables. So basically, you drop your keys, you put your secure boot in setup mode. For now, you put a special configuration item in your bootloader configuration. So you put secure boot unroll mode to force, and then your keys are going to be automatically unrolled next time you boot. And so you will transition from setup mode to, uh, you know, secure boot, full secure boot. So um, here, a very quick slide because really nothing very interesting happens. Um, it's just about uh, generating your own keys. So basically you generate a PK, you generate only one CAC on you generate one db uh, you sign the pk with your pk because it's self-signed you sign the cake with a pk um, and then you sign the db uh, with the cac then you sign your kernel uh, you should probably not forget to do that because otherwise yeah bad things are going to happen you also need to sign everything uh, you need to boot obviously and that gets me to my next slide, because um, you are probably already seeing a really big problem with this automatic process that enables secure boot. On um, yes, you are right. So tinkering with secure boot can lock you out of your system. Um, if you enable secure boot, but not everything that you needed to boot was signed properly, um, then you won't be able to boot anymore. Now, usually you just need to clear uh, the UFI and VRAM and you'll be fine. Um, now, it might be more complicated if you have some laptops um, so in my initial uh, pull request, um, Alexander on Martin um, brought up uh, the case of some users with laptops that had uh, option homes for their GPU. Um, in this case, the option home is not going to get signed. It is not going to be loaded and therefore the GPU is not going to work which is going to be a pretty bad problem for laptop because, well, you won't have anything on your screen showing up and even the external ports might be connected to the uh, GPU, which means you won't even be able to connect a screen to see what's going on. So it's going to be fairly hard to get out of that situation. Um, I suspect that there might be option arms for um, that are necessary for other stuff like enterprise storage system and stuff like that. Um, and so you should be very careful uh, what you do that with, pretty obviously. So um, that's why we made it kind of. Um, difficult to mess up with all the options. 
Um, but that's also why we're working on a potential solution, which would be involving UFI audit node on the TPM log. So um, the audit mode is uh, something I talked about um, earlier. Uh, it was in the UFI spec of 2015. And basically it allows you to uh, boot your system and instead of denying a uh, boot when you reach some kind of verification failure, you can log it instead of denying it straight away. So that would be a way to uh, make sure there are no bits that are not signed in the boot process and only lock up secure boots if we see that there wasn't any failures. So um, before we get to the part where um, I have several questions for you, and I'm going to ask you to, to, to talk, to voice your, your opinions and questions, I want to thank uh, first uh, Nicola and Mikael, uh, former colleagues of me, which have been tremendous inspiration for that. And I also want um, to thank Jan Johnson and Leonard Perdang for, they've been reviewing my PR and they've been great at it. And Systemd so far has been a wonderful community for a first contributor like me to, to work in. So thank you very much to them. Um, during this Sunday process, I also did a lot of Testing on the kernel EFI stub was, well, kind of amazing. It's magic, to be honest. So I want to thank everyone who's been involved in the EFI stub uh, kernel feature because, yeah, it, it's great. Thank you. So um, now it's going to be your time to talk. Uh, so I'm taking any feedback, comments, questions. Um, I'm considering adding support for DBX, so the uh, revocation list. Um, basically, for now, if you want to use multiple CACs, for example, you might want to use a, a third party uh, key in addition to your key, for example, Microsoft, it would probably be wise to also load uh, the DBX so yeah, that you don't allow uh, bootloaders that have been uh, known to be bad already. Uh, then like I mentioned, I want to eventually have a safer mode with uh, audit mode on the TPM log. Uh, one of the um, hold up on that front is that I didn't find much resources that could tell me um, where I could find a UFI firmware with audit mode. Like I haven't, uh, none of my computers have it. Um, and it seems to be pretty hard to find, uh, you know, which computer has this feature. Um, on more than that, I think um, EDK2 doesn't have audit mode support uh, just yet. So, yeah, so I think I'm done here. So uh, I can take any questions if there are any. So um, you said you don't want to use shim to reduce number of bootloaders, but if we want to use shim, would it be possible to enroll your own mark and still have the firmware components like GPU ROMs to be still functional? Yes. Um, so the way Shim works is that it essentially adds a stage to the verification. Um, so yes, you could be able to do that. Um, however, um, the thing is that you wouldn't able you wouldn't be able to um, remove the keys that are already in the uh, UFI firmware. So basically, um, your shim will probably be signed by Microsoft. Um, 
on so therefore it, it it's 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 valid uh, but you would still have third party pk on third party CAC, which is a problem i was trying to avoid so yeah as long as you're keeping the the, the original keys uh, there shouldn't be any problems with firmware components uh, and if you want to use that with technically i think if you want to use this um, method with the third party keys in the cake uh, you could. Uh, the thing is that some of the keys, for example, uh, Microsoft key in the CAC has signed in the past stuff that's been vulnerable. Um, so I wouldn't put the put a third party CAC without putting a DBX that has. Uh, everything that's been revoked. Um, so, should we add support uh, for bootstrap? Um, yeah, eventually, I think uh, I want bootstrap to be able to generate your secure boot keys. Uh, now, like with any problem involving cryptography, the thing is um just how involved do you want to be with managing keys because in the end it ends up being the main problem um so you need to kind of keep the thing is that you need to keep the keys around for signing more thing in the future because whenever you're going to be updating your kernel you might want to resign it so that would be nice um so you end up managing keys and uh, my personal preference is to generally avoid managing keys um, so when you say auto and all i think you mean that you are installing new public keys used to sign your kernel into the ufi yes uh, that's exactly what i mean so by auto unrolling i mean that when your um ufi is in setup mode um the pk cac db dbx are unprovisioned there's nothing in them and you fill them out and once you fill out the pk you transition into unforcing mode so enrollment is completed, you've loaded all of your public keys, and then it's only your keys now. I think I uh, the enrollment uh, word. I think I got it from the spec. Uh, I'm not sure if I invented the term enrollment uh, by myself. Uh, I think it's it comes from the spec. How many fee keys fit? Could I put a few extra in, in case I lose some? Well, well, um, so the PK is unique. So the PK, um, you know, you better not lose it. Now that said, it's only useful to sign the kecks. So technically, um, you know, there's only one, but at the same time, you only did it when you change CACs. Now the CACs you can have, um, from what I can tell, any number you want. Um, 
Um, technically, you could add more in there. Uh, I think the main problem would be with the DBX, actually. Um, the thing is that the DBX is some kind of revocation list, uh, that the NVRAM is actually uh, available to UFI is not that big. And I think eventually the DBX is going to be uh, too big. Uh, I think the DBX would really be the problem uh, first. And yes, like Jim Spodomly said, it's usually 64K. Uh, I mean, even, even if it was bigger, it's, it's, it's not really practical to do a lot of them. But yeah, so like James Bottomley is saying, there is a new revocation mechanism called uh, SBAT uh, because essentially DBX is taking more space. Um, DBX is a real problem on any large scale deployments. Um, So the CAC, the PK on the DB live on the UFI uh, partition. Uh, they don't really live there. They, they just dub there. Uh, it's a UFI secure variable. So it's uh, signed. Uh, and then when uh, the enrollment takes place, they're loaded into the NVRAM, yes. Well, thank you everyone for having me um, and good luck for the next presenter.